Ohio, and welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4, the legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal, Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend, tell a friend, to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On today's edition of Ralph Reads, I introduce Volume 1 as I open Book 2 of the beloved bellower of black love, Sister Soldier's Midnight and the Meaning of Love. We now visit Japan. I am that guy that will show you motherfuckers you. When it comes to this bonsai, there never was a buckaroo. For this W, I promise it'll be intense. Let the reading comment. Book 2, A Japan Story Chapter 1 First darkness, and then a small spotlight. Akemi's thick, natural lips appeared. They began moving, speaking to me, in her foreign tongue. Her voice was a melody of whispers. Her words were not as important as their intensity or the subtle shapes that her lips made when forming certain phrases. She had perfectly white teeth in both worlds, the real one and the one I was seeing now, and a pretty, pretty smile. Uniquely shaped eyes, wide and dark, filled with both curiosity and mischief. Hers were magnetic and seductive. Those eyes of hers always shined for me and reflected my image. In them were written her confessions of love. I saw her long pretty neck and lean and feminine shoulders where her dark hair draped. The feeling of her was all softness mixed with nothing else but sweetness. She was always warm for me and got more warmer the closer I came to her. Even when her lips were not moving, her silence was elegant and she made it known in every gesture and movement that everything she had was exclusively for me. Suddenly, I opened my eyes, and the seductive images slipped away. Absence is a powerful aphrodisiac, I thought to myself, but I didn't want to go too deep, feel too much too soon or have a private reaction in a public place. Instead, I reached into my inside right pocket and pulled out the translation of the letter Akemi had written to me a week ago on Saturday, the last day that we saw one another in New York City. It was sealed in an envelope. Even though I'd had the option, I had refused to read it while still standing on American soil, and before I was coasting through beautiful blue and white swirled skies to the land of the rising sun. I didn't want to know or hear anything from her that could possibly interrupt or delay or distract or discourage my journey to get what belonged to me. Her. Now that I was suspended midair with no possibility of anyone or anything turning me back, I opened it and read it. Slowly. Care, care, carefully. Mayonaka. We are young. 
but not too young to love. We are naive, but not too naive to know what we are feeling. Who put this love into the atmosphere and this craving into our bodies? Who put this feeling into our hearts and these thoughts into our minds? Who brought us together if we were supposed to be apart? We did right, so why do they say us is wrong? If not speaking any words in common could not stop our love, if being divided by culture or blood relations or even oceans could not stop our love, what can stop our love? No one. None. Nothing. Otoa-san, please don't hate my father because Oka-san loved him so. And I love my mother more than anyone could know. She has returned to the earth but lives on in my heart. Sometimes still we speak even though we're worlds apart. Daddy asked me what do you see in him or my bare skin against a sizzling hot rock. Remove him from your heart. Could I pull my teeth out one at a time? Or maybe peel off all of my own skin beginning with my fingers? I couldn't ever. I need him like a poor girl needs everyday rice. He is the deepest feeling I ever felt, like water rushing down from the steepest waterfall. If you are asking me not to love him, kill me. But if I should be reborn, I would love him still. My soul loves his soul. His soul loves my soul. No one can say they love Akimi yet try to separate me from this feeling. My Yonaka, they could never understand us. How could they? They don't even want to. My Yonaka, I'm so nervous. I read it once. Then I read it again, more slowly than the first time. I imagined my wife locked in the bathroom in the VIP section at the Museum of Modern Art on the day of the New York and American debut of her artwork. Wrapped in an awesome kimono with a multi-million dollar hairstyle, she stood barefooted on the cold marble floor with pretty feet and designer toenails. She was drawing kanji onto the page of her letter to me, the black ink smeared only by her tears, her heated thoughts and fears put into poetic verses. The crowd waited for her while she worried and waited for me. I could tell from her letter that she had argued with her father, her heart being pulled to one side by the man who had sighed her and pulled the other way by the man she had married. But I didn't know, never knew. She knew. I didn't know what was happening to her. So she sent a woman flying by foot to my job in Chinatown to deliver a letter to me written in a language that I couldn't understand because she felt that it was urgent and that something was about to go desperately wrong. And even still, she didn't spell her situation out clearly, or fill the pages up with rage and curses. She knew that would be too much. She knew me and what I was capable of. So she tried to convey the seriousness of the situation in the carefully placed words of her poem. I could feel my love for her swelling in my chest. After the feeling subsided some, my brain took over and shifted strictly into strategy. I looked up the word Otoa-san, although I believed I already knew what it meant. It means father, and Oka-san means mother. Would you like chicken or beef? The flight attendant had returned. For your dinner service, she added. I don't want anything, thank you, I told her. Something to drink? No, nothing, I responded. She smiled and moved on to the next passenger.
All that hard memory work only ate up two more flight hours. Just as I reclined, random people in the cabin began getting up and heading for the bathroom. I glanced down the aisle and saw that there was a line building up. I decided to try out Yuka's music and slipped on the headphones. She was listening to Megadeth, Killing Is My Business. She must have liked heavy metal, because that's what I was hearing. It was cool, as long as it was instrumental. The bass player and the guitar player were killing it. But then some dude started screaming out his lyrics. His voice was so loud, rough, and scraggly that I couldn't even figure if he was singing in Japanese or in English. I fast-forwarded and the music got worse. I took it off and laid it to the side. The in-flight movie selections for your enjoyment tonight are Dragon Ball, Curse of the Blood Rubies, or The Color Purple. The announcement was made in Japanese and then in English. Unfastening my seatbelt, I got up to head to the men's room. I needed the short walk to splash some cold water on my face. As I walked the narrow aisle, the now familiar flight attendant approached, heading in the opposite direction. I turned sideways to allow her through, yet still she brushed her body against me. And when our bodies connected, she paused right there. When you're finished in the lavatory, stay in the back. I'll come and quiz you, she said with a lowered voice, and then smiled and flashed forward. I didn't know what the f*** she was getting at. Coming out of that toilet, I bumped right into her. She was leaning on the opposite wall that was filled with compartments. Ready? She asked. Where are your cards? Let me see them. She held her hand out. She wore light pink tinted polish, had clean nails, and a cheap watch. Realizing her intent, I pulled the cards out of my pocket so she could use them to quiz me. Oh, hi, Hugo Saimas, she said in a small voice, not to disturb the other passengers. Good morning, I answered. That's okay, then, she said, smiling. Please help, I answered. Oh, tu san she asked. Father, I answered. Niki. To the right. Hidari, she said. Um, to the left, I answered. Masugu. Stray. Chotomati. She asked. Um, wait a minute. I remembered. You're good. She said, smiling some more. Are you sure you didn't know these words before you boarded our plane? No. I smiled at her distrust. You have a great mind. At first, I was expecting to find an uncompanied minor sitting in your seat. Instead, I found a handsome man. She gestured with one hand beside her face and moved it downward, actually touching me. All dressed and a genius. She tried to gas me up. Okay, one more. Here it goes. She said excitedly. Utsukushi. I had a mental picture of the words I had printed on my cards, and I didn't recall that word at all. Uh, that's not one of my words, I told her calmly. What does it mean? It means beautiful, she said, handing me back my cards and proceeded down the aisle before me. An elderly woman seated in the last row besides the men's room lifted her mask to reveal only one of her eyes and smiled at me. Then she put the mask back on. I guess she had overheard our exchange and had an opinion about it. Four more hours into the blackened and now cloudless sky, I became restless and wanted to get my music back. I headed up to seat 42A, where I discovered three solid rows of teenage girls sitting side by side in Yucca section. I wonder what kind of group they were traveling in. I didn't see any adults, but I figured it had to be a chaperone. Come to think of it, there were not any complete families traveling on this flight, it seemed. At least not in the coach section. 
You got, I called, but four arms went up immediately, and all at once, each turned on their overhead lights. Now, I had eight Asian eyes focused on me, but one girl in the middle didn't turn on her light. She was asleep. She was also pretty enough to distract me from swapping back my music. She was obviously Japanese and also obviously black, her skin the color of honey. Her eyelashes were as black as could be and unusually long. She wore cornrows, precise and perfect, that looked like bolts of lightning, lay tight and zigzagging across her scalp. Her hair was thick like ours, but long like theirs. I predicted that when she awakened and stood up, she would stand about five feet seven inches tall. Even though she was still sitting, I could see that she had the curves of a filled-out African female, but the delicate frame of a Japanese woman, too. I thought to myself, seeing her is like looking at a blue diamond, something you would hardly ever see. But if you happened to get a glimpse of one, you'd find yourself looking at it again and again. Kieza, Yuka said. Her voice brought me back to the reason I was there. What does that mean? I asked her. Her name is Kieza, she said, concerning the sleeping girl. I came from a walkman, I told her, but I glanced at the sleeping one again. She had a gold medal dangling on a red ribbon that she wore around her neck. It was rising up and down as she breathed in and out. Are you a part of a team? I asked Yuka. The other three girls were all watching curiously, but not speaking or joining in. I speak English, but my friends only speak a little, Yuka said, holding up her two fingers to gesture. A little bit. Yuka turned her body around away from me while still seated, revealing the chenille fabric kanji letters across the back of her jacket. Looking at them by the snatches of available light on the mostly dark plane, I asked, What does it say? Girls Kendo Club of Japan, she said with pride. Kendo Club? I asked. We fight, she said smiling. I laughed. What kind of fighting? Sore, she answered smoothly. I stepped back one step, impressed. Uh, how many are you? I asked. Sixteen, Yuka said. We are returning home from the competition. Your team won? I asked, while assuming. Our team came in third place, Yuka said. Then the girl seated next to her pointed to the sleeping girl, but didn't say anything. She won, I asked her. Kieza won the one in one competition, Yuka said reluctantly. Now she is just sleeping. Yuka wanted me to stay and talk to her about music and everything else. How many pairs of sneakers do you have? Who's your favorite performing artist? Have you ever seen the movie named Wild Style? Is this your first trip to Japan? She hit me with a slew of questions. Meanwhile, her three friends watched intently and seemed impressed with their bilingual leader, Yuka. They were in awe of her command of the all-English conversation. None of them could put together a complete English sentence, but when they did try and make little comments, I could understand their simple meaning and gestures each time. Each one of them was different from the others in looks and ways and feeling, and believe me, they checked me out thoroughly also. Let's trade something we don't have to take back. Yuka invited. I don't think so, I told her. Everything I have, I'm planning to keep. Just then, the sleeping girl shifted in her seat. Later, I said, and then turned to leave. Wait! Yuka said. You didn't tell us your name! I paused. Midnight, I answered. Oh, Yuka said. Doishite. Huh? I asked. Why you call midnight? She asked, her head looking up to me from her seat. Why are you called Yuka? I asked, standing still in the aisle. I'll tell you. She volunteered. Chotto mate kumasai. Will you stay a little longer? 
I was noticing, as I listened with the intent to learn, that Yuka was mixing a sentence half in Japanese, the other half in English. Here, I'll write it out for you. She took out a pen and some paper. All Japanese names have a meaning. It really depends on which kanji your parents used when they gave the name. My name is like this. She wrote in the paper. It means superior flower. Her name is Yuki. It's like this. She said writing. It means snow. Her name is Hikari, and it means light. And her name is Chao. It means butterfly. I watched and listened closely. To me, the kanji writing always looked powerful, passionate, and mysterious, even without me knowing its meaning. Kieza, what does her name mean? I asked casually, noticing that Yuka had skipped over her. I really don't know which kanji. Yuka answered hesitantly and laid her pen down on her tray. One thousand mornings! Yuki answered, proud to participate in overpronouncing and pushing out each English word separately. One thousand mornings, I repeated. Kieza's name sounded soulful to me. Then I wondered about the true meaning of it. I wanted to know why she had that name, the story behind it. It sounded more powerful than the simple definitions of the other girls' names. What about yours? What does it mean? Yuka asked. Think about it, I answered. It was nice meeting you, Yuka, Yuki, Hikari, and Chao. They applauded because I remembered. I wondered if they had met other foreigners who couldn't remember or pronounce their short and simple names. Then I threw the thought right out of my mind. Them girls were just bored and anxious to get off this tight flight, same as me. We were all teenagers, traveling in an adult world. Our bodies packed with energy, but forced to sit still on the flight for hours and hours. As I returned to my seat, I caught glimpses of one of the in-flight films playing on at least half of the screens in my area. Even without the volume, I could see a full cast of black men as fools, clowns, and useless, cruel creatures. Those are the black Americans, I thought to myself. With time, I became more and more anxious to see my wife. So time cruelly doubled down and began to move twice as slow. We were halfway there now. I prepared to have the dinner that my family packed me, feeling some strange sense of comfort about eating as most of the other passengers slept. After washing up in the men's room and pulling down the shopping bag with the metal tiffin containers of my food, I hit the call button and requested water. Mizu? The flight attendant said, offering the Japanese word for water. Gabu. She said for cup. She looked at my food and said, Oishi mitadeska. It looks delicious. Could I? She asked. Is it spicy? She translated. Definitely spicy, I admitted, as I tried to write these new words that she was using down in my memory. Definitely better than plain food, she said, leaning in too close. She laughed lightly. Right, was all I said. Finally, she left. As I enjoyed the way Sudanese leftovers can taste even better and even richer than when they were first prepared and served, I thought about how Ramadan began at sunset on Saturday in America, which meant fasting would begin at sunrise on Sunday morning. I kept myself occupied trying to figure out what time it was now and what was my exact location over which country. I recalled the map I had surveyed, then purchased at Marty Bookbinder's bookstore. I was flying from the United States, New York to be exact, out over Alaska, past Canada, past the Siberian mountains, past Russia, 
Then I broke out into a smile. A man has to work hard for his woman, I thought. Moments later, I checked my watch, still set on New York Eastern Standard Time. Back in Brooklyn, it was 2 a.m. I cleaned up my area, content, and headed to the back to rinse my containers. Returning, I met Yuka walking up the aisle. We both stopped at my seat. As I packed the clean containers back into the shopping bag and pushed it back into the overhead compartment, Yuka made me an offer. Let me keep the music that you let me listen to before. You can choose one of these. I sat down, not feeling right about standing over her in such a closed area. She pulled up my tray from his side pocket, which made me have to straighten up my posture. She laid down a piece of paper shaped like a bird. It's a paper crane, you know, origami. It's good luck. Yuki made it. I just looked at it. It was crafted well, but I didn't feel no connection to it. She put a card down. It's a Japanese phone card. It's mine, but you'll need it. She said, so sure that she had me open. My non-response made her put down her next item. It was a red patch with two black swords clashing in midair. I liked it. It's from our dojo, she said, knowing it was worth more than the other choices she was offering. I figured it probably belonged to one of them girls who was supposed to be worn on their jacket sleeve or uniform. You must really like my music, I said. She ignored my statement and tried to flip it on me. You like it, I can tell, she said, then pointed at the patch. When you like something, it shows just a little bit on your face, she said, holding up her two fingers once again. For a little bit. Oh yeah, no one ever said that, I told her swiftly. Maybe they were not looking closely, she said, and held her hand out for my music. Take this one. I slid her the cassette bangs I'd given me the other night. It was Frankie Beverly and Mays, a joint called Before I Let Go, Sweet Thing by Shaka Khan, and a bunch of slow cuts I didn't want or need to feel. As she put it in her pocket, an older lady appeared and stood behind her in the aisle. Just one look, the older lady gave her, and no words. Yuka turned, bowed to the older woman, and then rushed up the aisle back to her seat. The lady turned and followed her and stood by her seat once she reached it. If she was scolding Yuka, it was a silent scolding, because I could not hear a word or see her attitude in her gestures or body language. She must be their chaperone, I thought. Somehow, whatever adult is assigned to chaperone teenagers always falls asleep before us, or is absent at the exact moment that something they are supposed to be preventing is going down. Or maybe she was seated up in business class, or first class even, as her girls were packed like sardines and coach. In the morning... The cabin lights were on full blast, and it was too bright. I thought the sunlight was forcing me to squint, but it wasn't. The stink of pork hung in the stagnant air as passengers sucked down two one-inch cube squares of egg and one undercooked-looking slice of ham. I looked to my left toward the window as the passenger across the aisle at the window seat began lifting his window cover. It was actually nighttime all over again, although my watch said on American time, read 6 a.m. We are one hour away from Narita Airport. The time in Tokyo is now 6 p.m. Your flight attendant will be coming through the cabin, collecting your trays, and accepting trash. We would appreciate your cooperation in keeping the arms clear. We will be landing at 7 p.m. Tokyo time. Please accept and complete your landing cards and custom documents. Your flight attendants will be distributing them throughout the cabin. My tray was still up, but my patch was gone. I smiled at the thought that I had been hustled by Yuka, played out before I even touched down on their soil. 
I leaned over, thinking maybe I dropped it beneath my seat. When I raised my tray and leaned forward to look, I was more than surprised to see the patch sewn onto my jeans on my left leg. I pulled at it thinking, nah, that's impossible. But the patch didn't fall off or peel off into the palm of my hand either. It was stitched on crudely, not expertly, but attached. I sat up, put my right hand on my head instinctively, and held it there. I imagine Yuka sitting in the aisle late at night next to my seat, sewing the patch on so secretly that even I could not feel or detect it. I felt the cross between being a dupe and being snagged off guard. The landing form required me to write in the address where I would be staying in Japan. I was also asked to report exactly how much money I was carrying. They asked if I'd ever been convicted of a crime. I answered thankfully, no. The paperwork warned that I must always be in possession of my passport as I traveled throughout their country. I printed in the address for Shinjuku Uchi, my hostel, located in Shinjuku, Tokyo. I filled out all the custom forms and pressed them inside my passport. I placed the items in my inside pocket and unfastened my seatbelt and stepped to the bathroom. When I returned to my seat, there was a folded piece of paper on my chair. I removed the paper and read it. It was an address with Yuka's full name on the top as well as her telephone number. I pushed it in my pocket and sat down. I wondered about their whole crew, their ages and all. I was sure they were teens. A couple of them might have even been a couple of years older than me. I was also sure that they could never guess my age either. Mostly everyone thought I was older than I am. I didn't correct them either. Fasten your seatbelts for landing. All standing passengers slowly returned to their seats, pushed their belongings back into the overheads, lifted their window covers, raised their seats, and fastened their seatbelts. I can't front. My face was calm and regular, but now I was hyped up like crazy and completely awake. Narita Airport was very bright clean, and well-organized. While riding the belt that moved hundreds of passengers forward as they stood still, I took note of the colorful photography. Among the advertisements were huge pictures of cherry blossom trees, various flowers, and even animals. When I looked out through the huge windows and onto the tarmac, I saw several huge aircraft lined up from countries spanning the world. I watched as the luggage from arriving passengers was moved by conveyor onto luggage trucks and driven away to their terminals. The geography book I had read about Japan in the Open Mind bookstore described it as a small island, quote-unquote, as several uniformed workers in jumpsuits moved around the tarmac and the active airport extended as far as I could see in each direction. I thought to myself that this place looked huge, profitable, and powerful. On our way to customs, through wide corridors that seemed empty, except for the hundreds of passengers from our flight, I reached an intersecting corridor. A whole new flood of people joined in, and that made about 700 of us moving toward the customs area. Signs positioned above the flow of the people printed in every language broke up the huge crowd and ordered us to different locations. Japanese citizens returning home to Japan went one way and all other passengers went the other according to the signs that applied to them. When my group arrived at the designated location, we were met by about 15 floor guides. Japanese men and women in identical spotless and well-pressed uniforms, men in blue pants, white business shirts and jackets, and women in jackets, white blouses and skirts with silk scarves around their necks. 
Most of the women had their hair pulled back and expertly wrapped, folded, and pinned into an array of styles without a strand escaping. I noticed how they all held their hands interlocked in front of themselves instead of casually at their sides. Their stance seemed trained and uniform. Red ropes directed all our movements, and from time to time, the guides used their hands to gesture without words, which I found interesting. They were all wearing white, sparkling, clean gloves. The line advanced quietly and slowly. I thought about pulling out my pocket dictionary and practicing vocabulary words while I waited. I took a few steps forward, stopped, and took a quick look back. I saw the girl they said was named Chiesa on the line a few spaces back. I was perplexed now. She held an American passport in her hand. But wasn't she part of a Japanese girls' kendo team just returning from a competition in America? I didn't want to stare, even though I was curious. I turned back toward the front, facing the single file line that went on around a maze of ropes and barriers. Five minutes later, I looked back again. Immediately, I saw she was looking my way. We both shifted our eyes away from one another. One of the floor guides appeared on the opposite side of the rope where I was standing. I thought he was going to say something to me. Instead, he went to the man standing behind me. Apparently a father with his wife and their two children. The floor guide held up the landing card as if to ask, Where is it? The husband turned to his wife and she turned to her son. The floor guide pointed the four of them off the line and over to the desks where there were more cards available for completion. Now Chiesa was standing directly behind me. I thought to myself, she feels like a gift from Allah, although I didn't really know the reason. Then I imagined if Akemi and I had a daughter, she would look like Chiesa. And what would our son look like? I wanted him to be black-skinned like me, although it would be okay if he weren't. But as I pictured my great-grandfather, grandfather, Father, myself, and then my son, I wanted us all to be similar in complexion, size, thought, and action. Sumimasen, move up. Someone said softly. I stepped forward and looked back. When we were facing each other, we both asked one another at the same time, Are you American? Then we both smiled at the coincidence and we both answered simultaneously, No. Then we both looked at each other's hand, her left, my right, and we were both holding blue American passports with the eagle emblazoned in gold. Neither of us bothered to explain Nice patch, she said, staring down at my pant leg. Is it just fashion, or did you fight for it? Her arms were now folded in front of her, and she was still holding on to her documents. I didn't fight for it, but I can't fight, I answered her with a serious look. What's your weapon? I don't advertise it, I told her. But I know yours is the sword, I added, to let her know that this was not my first time seeing her. Her eyes widened a bit. I could see how her long lashes could shield anyone from seeing directly into her silver-gray eyes. I saw you sleeping on the plane. I wasn't sleeping, she said with a completely straight face. I was practicing. Practicing what? I asked. I was practicing making people feel sure that I was sleeping, she said. I paused. I thought our conversation was feeling strange. She was a young female traveling alone, and I was a young man doing the same. I just turned my attention back to the front of the line. 
moved a few steps up, and waited. When people think that someone is asleep, they say things that they wouldn't say when the person is awake. She broke our silence, leaning in a bit to speak to me from behind. I get it, was all I said. Are you in the military? She asked. No, I responded, thinking to myself, maybe she is. She started this conversation asking me if I could fight and about my choice of weapons and now if I was in an army. That's good. She smiled. I wanted to know what her smile was about. Are you in the military? I asked her, but I wasn't serious. No, but my father is, she said. That straightened me. I knew the difference between a girl who has a father and a girl who does not. And I was sure now that since she mentioned her father, he would be standing somewhere near the luggage arrival waiting for his beautiful daughter to arrive back into his care. He is a decorated marksman. He could kill you from a long distance, she said calmly, as though this were casual, everyday information. I figured she wanted me to know that she is protected the way daughters who have fathers are protected. I got it. He has perfect vision, and so do I, she added. The feel to her was different than anything I ever felt coming off a girl. She didn't speak with arrogance or conceit or eagerness in her tone. Yet, she was softly saying some powerful and proud statements that lay on top of a hidden threat. And she was exotic and pretty as a puma. I turned forward and didn't say nothing back to her. Soon, she stepped to my side, glanced at the landing card I was holding, and asked, Are you staying in the hostel? Why? Do you have a recommendation for me? I asked her, dodging. It depends on what you are here to do and see. She said it like it was a question. She wanted to know what I was in Japan for. I wasn't about to start spilling my guts on the line when I was about to meet up with a customs officer. So I didn't say. So you staying in Shinjuku? That's one five-second train stop away from me. I stay in Yoyogi with my grandfather. She was reading the documents as I held them in my hand. I told you I have perfect vision. I saw it written on your cards. She said, answering a question that I never asked her. She asked sweetly, staring at me while one of her eyebrows raised up a bit, anticipating I would fail her test. But I was already searching my mind. I knew I had a phrase like that written in my study cards. I had a six-second delay before I answered her. Hi. Nihongo ga hanasimasen. Which means, no, I don't speak Japanese. But it was the answer to a question. She laughed quietly, but still lifted her hand to cover her mouth and muffle her sound. With her hand lifted, I could see her landing card where she had entered her birth date. Now I knew that she was 16 years old with a birthday coming up in two months on July 25th. You will need a tour guide and you will need a translator. She raised both eyebrows this time. I'll get one, I told her. I'll take care of it. How many days are you staying here? She asked while reaching into her pocketbook, placing her passport and landing cards inside, and then pulling out a small yellow calendar. She opened it up. The pages were worn. She ran her finger across the days of this month of May. She had something written in most of the boxes that represented the 31 days. A short stay, I said. I'm good, though. I'm meeting someone in Tokyo. With her calendar raised and covering her nose and mouth, only her eyes could be seen. We should meet for just one afternoon, you and I, she said. I was looking right back at her. Before I responded to her bold approach, she said, Let's meet up and fight. You said you can fight, right? She was straight-faced and feminine and soft, but her words 
were the opposite. Now she was holding one hand behind her back. My natural smile broke out. I was considering how each woman is a different combination of traits. And what a combination this one had. Her voice was soft and slightly raspy. Like a girl on the third day of a cold. But the words coming out of her mouth didn't match her feminine appearance or her sultry voice. I don't fight women. Not ever. I told her truthfully. When I'm next to a woman, the last thing that I'm thinking is that she and I should fight. She stared for a few seconds and then smiled. But then she became suddenly shy. Besides, why would I fight a girl who just told me her father is a marksman? I reminded her. My father's stationed overseas right now. He won't be back to Japan until the autumn festival. That's... She counted on her long, slim fingers. She had clean nails, clipped short, and wore no jewelry. That's five months from now. But even though he's not here, if he thought someone had done something bad to me, he'd find him and kill him. If I had a daughter, I would do the same, I assured her. It wouldn't matter if they hid. My father can't find anyone in the world, no matter where they run. I didn't comment any further. She had a strong love and a spoken loyalty and pride about her father, and I thought it was fly. You know, you've arrived during Golden Week, but you already missed a lot of the events. She said, switching topics. Golden Week? What's that? I asked. Completely blank about it. Golden Week, she repeated. It's the second largest Japanese holiday. All schools are closed and many companies are also. It's called Golden Week, but sometimes it goes on for about 10 days to 2 weeks. Most Japanese spend this holiday with their families. A lot of us traveling during this time, as you can see. I guess that's why there were so many sports teams on our flight. Immediately, my mind jumped to my wife. Maybe that's why she had been calling me from Iowa's house in Tokyo instead of from her own house in Kyoto. So have I arrived at the beginning or the end of Golden Week? I asked her. The end? She responded. Um, I thought... Chiesa had given me useful information in less than five minutes. I was grateful. So the person you are meeting in Tokyo, is it Yuka? She asked. Nah, I just met her on the plane, I told her. Good, because she's originally from Osaka. I was born in Tokyo and lived there my whole life. I used to deliver pizza on my motorcycle, so I know all the streets and cool places. You drive a motorcycle? Yes. My father bought it for me on my 16th birthday. It was an apology gift because I hadn't seen him for six months. My mother hated it, but I loved it. My mother will only pay for things that she likes me to do. So she pays for my piano lessons and dance classes because she says those things are for good Japanese girls. I have to work to pay for the lessons I want and the things I like. I hate playing the piano and dancing ballet, but I do it because it keeps my mother happy. She shifted her body slightly. Ballet dancing obviously kept her body right, I thought to myself. You say you stay with your grandfather? Yes, my parents are divorced, she admitted in a much softer voice with traces of hurt and regret. It was one of those nasty divorces. They don't speak to another and I can't mention my father's name to my mother or ask any questions. They both love me, just not each other. I felt sorry that her mother and father had somehow lost their love for one another. It sounded foreign to me, losing love for anyone you had ever loved. And the same way when I first laid eyes on this girl, I could see traces of her Japanese mother and her African father without ever seeing either of them or knowing them. I wondered how could they have this lovely daughter together 
see her and not see themselves. When the father saw the mother through the daughter, didn't it make him remember loving his wife? Wouldn't it cause him to love her even more? I guess not. Man to man, I would want to ask these kinds of questions and get serious responses. When men gather, we don't talk like that. And the questions that sit on our minds, we won't ask. Again, I felt an urgency about my wife as I was being presented with the exact picture of what I would never allow to happen in my family. In the Quran, there are instructions about exactly how a divorce can be carried out. But divorce is discouraged in our way of life. The Quran gives a man not only instructions, but boundaries, limits, and goals to hold his head and his family together and to deal with his wife in a just way that will help them to stay together. But my grandfather is cool. My mom is his daughter, so of course he loves her. But he loves my dad also, so I love him. So I stay with him. Anyway, I'll start school in one month and move out into the dorm. Oh yes, school in Japan begins in April. I know it starts in September in America, right? And it ends in June? Well, here, our school year had just begun. Your school year just started in April and already you're on vacation? I know, it is different, but this is Japan. We do it our own way, she said, smiling. And while she smiled, I thought of how Akemi's father probably snatched her up and took her right to school to start the Japanese school year after her year of living and schooling in New York City had come to an end. He probably was acting as though nothing significant had really happened in her life, as though she never met me, fell in love, married, and gave me her oath and virginity and life. My school actually also began in April, but not for me. Foreign students had to come in and take an intensive Japanese language course. I didn't need to. I was born here, and I speak fluent Japanese and English. So you see, it works out good for you because now I'm off from school, and for 29,000 yen, I can show you around Tokyo for the next five days. I'll be your translator and your tour guide. I can meet you in the morning and stay each day until the job is done. She was speaking softly but with confidence and a gentle persuasion, as though I had no choice but to go along with her plan. I was still stuck on the figure 29,000 yen. I had not shifted my mind into their money exchange system yet, but the numbers she was throwing around sounded expensive, crazy, extreme, and not happening. Where did you come up with that number? I asked her. That's how much it costs for my next flight lesson. I'm studying to get my pilot's license. She had my head spinning. Now I was picturing her in the cockpit. The floor guide gestured for me to step up to customs. So I said later to Chiesa and moved up to the booth. I saw her move to the booth beside mine on command as well. At customs, the kind of tension that was so thick when I arrived in America from the Sudan with Uma was not present in Japan. The male authority who faced me didn't appear to believe that I was a problem that had to be eliminated guilty on sight. Even though he represented Japanese law, he didn't try to put in place a whole new set of restrictions just for me. The officer a blank-faced Japanese male, simply looked at my passport and then up in my face. He stepped to his left, pointed a camera at me, and snapped my photo. He stamped my passport, inserted a piece of paper, and waved me on. I looked at the stamp and the paper. 
It said I could visit Japan for 90 days before I was required to leave. It also instructed me to keep my passport in my possession at all times. At the luggage conveyor, while waiting for my duffel bag to come around, I calculated finally that 29,000 yen was about $250. The American dollar was stronger than the yen and $85 would get me 10,000 yen. Five days for $250, I thought. That's $50 a day. It was high, but not too high. I knew from the jump that I would have to get someone to translate for me along the way. This girl Chiesa had offered me enough information in a short period of time for me to feel comfortable with her offer. I'd get her phone number and use her services when I needed them. For now, I was throwing my belongings on a cart and heading for the phone to call my wife. Midnight! I heard a voice call. It was Yuka and her friends. They were waving wildly. I put my hand up once as my way to say sayonara. I did notice that the rest of their kendo team seemed to be traveling together, but Kiesa was left standing alone, pulling her belongings off the belt for herself. Beyond customs and baggage, when I reached the Japanese side of the airport, everything changed. Signs were all written in kanji. At the airport convenience store, I stood silently in the aisle observing. The foods and drinks were all labeled in kanji. I recognized some American candies like Snickers and Juicy Fruit only because of the identical colors of the Japanese packaging. But the names of the candies were all written in kanji. Even the ingredient listings were all in kanji. As I approached the cashiers and instinctively spoke in simple English, they looked at me curiously. I realized they spoke and understood only Japanese, even down to the words like yes and no, as well as greetings. I wanted to purchase a phone card, but stood staring at the wall, unable to decipher which was what. Unable to read properly, I thought about Uma. Her everyday life in America was like this. As a man, it was an uncomfortable feeling to me to not be able to read the language of the place where I was standing, living, and breathing. Illiteracy reduced me, I thought, into the position of a young child. I observed the cash transactions taking place. Unlike the Americans, the Japanese cashiers received the payment from the customer and placed it down on the register for both the customer and cashier to see. They repeated the amount of the purchase, the amount they received, and then counted out the change and handed it to the customer before putting away the cash the customer had paid. I figured they wanted to eliminate any problems before they could occur. A forgetful customer or con man would never get away with saying, I gave you a 20, when they had really only paid with 10. I liked the way the girls folded the bills perfectly between their fingers and held them there. I liked the way the cashiers counted back the cash rapidly after spreading the bills like a hand fan. I picked up my bags, turned, and walked out, looking for a public payphone. When I finally found it, I picked up the phone and stood staring. All the printed directions were in Japanese. I couldn't even figure out the cost of the call. I put the receiver to my ear. The recorded voice on the other end of the phone was speaking only in Japanese. I looked around the well-lit, immaculately clean, and well-organized airport and thought to myself, I searched out the customer information desk. 
was told to choke tomate by a small polite man who raised his index finger to signal, wait one minute, please. Choke tomate, I repeated it to myself for my own memorizing. The woman who appeared to help me spoke some English. She asked me a few questions, then told me which phone card to purchase and how to work the payphone. She also told me how and where to purchase my ticket for the airport limousine to Shinjuku. I didn't need a limousine, but the ticket only cost $20. It was a two-hour ride, so I agreed. Then I called Uma. Alhamdulillah, she said in her early morning relaxed Sunday voice. We are all safe and fine. You know that you can call me anytime you want to talk, but focus on your wife now. She needs you more, Uma said graciously. I called Iowa Akita at 9 p.m. The call went right through. Mushy mushy, a feminine voice said. Is this Akita's son? I asked. Hi, she responded softly, yet with excitement. This is my Yonaka. Thank you for taking my call. Is my wife there? I asked calmly, though I was feeling anxious. Akimi Nakamura, is he there? I asked patiently and politely as well. Iwa Akita said something in response, but I couldn't hear it because an announcement came over the speaker system in the airport. The announcement was spoken in Japanese, so I ignored it. Akita-san? Hi. Chotomate. She answered. My heart raced some. Mayonaka? I heard Iwa's voice again. Where are you? She was speaking English in an even higher-pitched tone than she used before. I paused. I wanted to hear Akemi's voice first before answering any questions. Instead, I heard a click. click. The payphone went dead. Immediately, I called back. I got the answer machine. Her message was spoken all in Japanese. But even an idiot could understand to begin leaving his message after the beep. So I did. Akita-san, we were disconnected. I'll call back again in five minutes. Five minutes later, I called and got her answering machine again. I hung up. I stood there, thinking. What's the meaning of this? Five more minutes, and I called once more. Her machine came on. Calmly, I left my second message. I'll call back in the morning. This is my Onaka. I was tight now, uneasy, and perplexed. This was some unnecessary bullshit. My limo was due to arrive outdoors at space number 18. I pushed my cart through the sliding doors. As I eased down the walkway, I saw Chiesa standing on the line behind her push cart loaded down with bags and big items. She had one item that was in a case that stood seven feet tall. She also had what looked like a trombone case and two suitcases, one big. One small. She was about five foot seven with a powerful body and a petite frame. I didn't know how she was gonna move around and all that stuff on her own once she had to ditch the airport cart and travel back into Tokyo. Can I have your telephone number? I asked her, handing her a pencil and my small pad that I kept in my pocket for important information and contacts. She wrote it down instantly, as though she had been sure that I would find her and ask. I'm never really home, so we should set a time, she said. Let's meet tomorrow night. That will give you time to figure out that you won't be able to figure anything out, she added, completely assured. Then we can meet at my dojo, fight, and get it over with. I think people respect each other faster if they fight first. Experience each other's style. 
Then she wrote down the name of her dojo and the address, and in bold ink, 6 p.m. We'll eat dinner together afterward. Chapter 2 I checked my watch and looked for the number 18, hoping it was written in English. When I saw my limousine, it was a bus. Quote unquote airport limousine hired hands took my luggage and stored it below. After receiving luggage tags, we entered the bus single file. It took only a few seconds to notice that no one six feet tall or taller had ever ridden the bus comfortably, as the ceilings were too low and the seats too close together. However, the bus was obviously brand new and very clean. The bus windows even had curtains fit to size that were retractable. The workers and the bus driver were very polite. The seats were well upholstered in quality cloth and colorful designs. The headrests were covered with removable white lace without a trace of dirt or grease or stains. There were 22 passengers besides me. Each of us spread out trying to keep the seat directly next to ourselves free for our extra use. Compact cars seem to be the preferred ride out here. Toyotas and Hondas and some other unrecognizable vehicles that aren't for sale in America. Different styles, makes, and models. Even the trucks were less wide and tall than the American kind. The highways were well paved and free of potholes and detours and debris. The lanes were wide and clean. The ride was smooth. The lines on the ground looked perfect, as though they had just been painted on. Soon the scenes changed from the stretch of airport property to rural, to suburban, to city. The traffic was flowing steadily without any congestion. Other than vehicles, billboards, and buildings, I couldn't clock much because it was night. The dim lights in the bus made it difficult to see out unless I pressed my forehead on the window glass. A female's clear and soft voice of recording offered narration over a speaker system explaining where we were, where we were headed, and calling out the name of each stop in several languages. The bus was so organized and clean that even though I wished the seats were bigger, the trip was more comfortable than an NYC ride anywhere by bus train, or car. I thought that arriving in Shinjuku late at night would put me at a disadvantage since I was unfamiliar with the place and its layout. Yet, at Shinjuku Station, the night was the same as day. Although it was now 11 p.m., the station was packed with people as though this was their peak hour. Even though New York is known as the city that never sleeps, Tokyo was quite different. In New York, there is a day crowd and a night crowd. No way can the New York night crowd match the numbers that flowed through the city during working hours. But here in Shinjuku, it seemed to be happening. Men and women in suits, teenagers, families, and tourists were all moving about. This wasn't the club crowd or the party crowd. These just seemed like everyday normal people ignoring the time and living to the fullest or perhaps just getting off from work, working 12-hour days or coming back from night schools. I wasn't sure. Everything was all lit up with high-watt fluorescent bulbs. The only crime was to stop moving because the heavy population was constantly flowing It was seemed like a daily march routine and rhythm. I put one strap of my duffel bag on my left shoulder and the other strap on my right. I picked up my carry-on and began walking. I had an option to jump in the cab, but I decided against it. I had checked the map, knew the direction I was to move in, and was drawn in by everything I was seeing and feeling. It was bogged out seeing hundreds and thousands of Japanese and a splash of other Asian faces and no whites. 
it was obvious that this was their country. Confidence comes in numbers, I know. They were packed in escalators and in all the corridors, the small and the wide, spinning through all the turnstiles and jamming through all the exits and entrances all at the same time. As I exited the west side of Shinjuku Station, along with 300 other walkers, I ran up on the wall of vending machines. I stepped all the way in to keep out of the way of the flow. Of course, I had seen vending machines before in Brooklyn, back when Uma was in the hospital, giving birth to nausea. Yet these machines were different, with different designs and styles, and products for sale, and much more plentiful. I counted seven on the wall I was staring at, and five directly across the street. Less than 60 seconds standing on my feet in Shinjuku, and all I could think about was business. One vending machine sold cigarettes, a variety of brands. I thought about how that couldn't happen in the U.S. because you had to be a certain age to buy cigarettes, and in the business district, you definitely would get carted. On my block, and in some local hoods, kids would cop Lucy's for a quarter each. Even though the kids were underage, some shop owners would risk their licenses just to keep the peace with the customers and particularly good customers who sent their 10-year-old daughters and sons to pick up cigarettes for them. The next vending machine was selling beer and liquor. I didn't recognize some of the brands, but I imagined how much money a vending machine liquor store could make on my block alone. Except... If there was a vending machine offering beer or liquor on my Brooklyn block, the owner would have to bulletproof it and use plexiglass instead of real glass. He'd have to build it, sunken into the cement, and still put heavy chains around it also. The next machine sold hot coffee, iced coffee, hot tea, or iced tea. Drop a coin in that sucker and the can came out fully heated. I tried it out even though I didn't want to drink no coffee. The can was so hot I had to throw it back and forth in my hands to cool it off. The next machine sold hot soups of various kinds. The one beside it sold water, juices, and sodas. The next machine sold toothpaste and shaving cream, combs and toothbrushes, and even had a row of men's new and clean white underwear individually wrapped that could be purchased. Drop in the coin, and they fell right out of the bottom slot. But the most fascinating vending machine was the last one on this row. It had a slot for bills and a separate one for coins. Put in your yen and get a brand new pair of kicks. Get the f*** out of here, I thought to myself. Sneakers? What about a Nike vending machine? What a quiet and intelligent way to earn money 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I will be earning money on the Christian's Christmas, on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, on all the dead president's birthdays and Labor Day, too. It was a good legal business, but I imagine it involved about 85% less effort than Uma Designs. If I owned even one of these machines, I could come around at 3 or 4 in the morning, collect my stack and rack of bills and bags of coins, and no one would even know who was the mastermind behind my operation. I would switch up my schedule, keep it random, so that no one could clock my movements. Unlike being a store owner and having to sit in the same store all day and welcome any type of customer, if I own all seven of these machines, no one would even know my name or address or personal information. Ninja style. I looked the machines over, searching for a company name or phone number. I wanted to jot it down in my notebook and maybe took a serious look into the business of it. I found a metal plate with information on it all written in kanji and completely incomprehensible to me. I pushed it off, but I knew I'd be back. I planned to hold on to the idea. As I moved, my mind kept coming with estimates on how much each machine cost 
how much it costs to stock it, and guesses about how many people flow through this Shinjuku area day and night and night and day. In this city of lights, every single store was lit up with bright colors that popped. It was impossible to overlook those brilliant reds blaring, some blinking, some neon. There were hot pinks and electric blues and blinding yellow gold lights as well. On the building tops were gigantic television screens, flashing advertisements, the product changing every few seconds. There were people hired to hand out cards and flyers and tissue packs with ads plastered across the backside. There were dancing girls in go-go shorts and leather boots singing jingles to draw in customers. The lights were not in just one section. They went on as far as my eyes could see in every direction. I was passing by late night bookstores. Imagine that. A place where readers could chill and read no matter the time of night. These bookstores were packed, not empty like Marty Bookbinders. And in the slow walk I was on, it seemed that there were as many bookstores in Shinjuku as the hood had liquor stores and churches. The streets were lined with vendors manning food carts. They had raised umbrellas and hung lanterns and brought in stools seated close to the ground. They also sat on upside-down crates. There were small portable tables with stacks of chopsticks and sauces and glasses placed on each one. I couldn't tell you what food they were serving. I looked, but I didn't recognize it. The main thing was, business-wise, people were eating it up eagerly. Several couples were seated side by side, enjoying. I wondered if these carts were considered licensed and legal or if at a certain moment they will have to break it all down and pack it up and start hauling and running like in New York where random vendors live a dog's life and get got for their products by crooked cops who steal their merchandise from them and still hand them a high price ticket for a, quote, city code violation, unquote. But I didn't see nobody running and I didn't see no cops. Everyone was working or walking calmly, serving customers or minding their business and keeping it moving. I respected that. I thought it was an oversized arcade, but it wasn't. It was a spot called Pachinko. It took me about three and a half minutes to figure out this was their gambling spot. Strange hustle, I thought. There were about... 350 men sitting in front of individual machines that looked like pinball machines with a bucket filled with tiny silver balls. They kept feeding the machines with the balls in hopes of a jackpot, but it looked like they never reached a jackpot. A lot of these men appeared to be businessmen who hadn't been home from work since they'd left probably early this morning. Still wearing their suits, they had their briefcases and one or two bags of groceries sitting beside them. There was nothing between them and that pachinko machine except tobacco clouds as they smoked more and more with each try for fast money. Rows and rows of restaurants were squeezed into tight spaces. I laughed at joints that were legit eating spots, quote-unquote. So small that they only had three tables and six chairs. I tried to do the math on how many guests they had to turn all day to make their money back with only a six-person capacity. Some small spots had no tables, but had instead one long counter for their customers to eat on and six stools. Their customers all ate facing the wall. Not too cool for families and couples, I figured. The architecture and craftsmanship of each of these shops was dope, though, and each one has its own style. Some were made all from glass. I could stand outside and see everything that was going on inside. I could see the cooks, who were mostly males, wearing either white chef jackets or long chef aprons. Their pants wide and baggy, but cinched by a drawstring at the waist and ankles. 
Most of them cover their heads with white hand towels wrapped half like a turban and half like how some Brooklyn cats rock it in the summer or after a game. I could watch them chopping vegetables, grilling fish, and boiling pots of water and stirring soups with a paddle because the iron kettles were so wide and deep. Right next door would be a restaurant made only of wood, no glass. I could not read the kanji signs that identified who they were and what they were selling. But when the door slid open, I could see the crowd seated elbow to elbow and could tell whatever it was, it was in high demand. Noodle shops were easy to recognize. They were packed with mostly men, each of them seeming not to be with the other, all their backs bent over and faces close to their bowls. On the streets of northern Sudan, where I'm from, many men moved with men and their sons or their fathers. So a place where men and women moved in separate packs at separate times to separate places was not unfamiliar to me. It didn't take long for me to note that in many cases, I stood taller than the front door of these establishments. These seats were so close together and people so uniformly slim that I thought I might be too broad and muscular to fit into their shoulder and shoulder seating pattern. This made me feel bigger than life and dominant, like the character named Gulliver, whose story I once read. I was a foreigner, watching each of them and all of their things and ways so closely, yet not one of them was watching me. I felt like a black leopard in the chicken coop, or even out in the wetlands where the gazelles gathered, while I was camouflaged by the night. Not that I was on the prowl or the attack, but I was definitely capable of being provoked. Before I rounded the bend to the side alley where the hostel was supposed to be located, I saw one half-wooden, half-glass shop on the corner where there was a full pig's leg with the black hoof still attached, hoisted, and mounted on the same counter where the customers sat eating. The cook stood on the opposite side of the counter and carved slices of the pork and placed it in box plates for the customer to eat. It got me more alert. I always know, as a Muslim, I have to be mindful of any eating place because of the difference between what we are forbidden to eat and what others accept. I knew the international symbol for halal restaurants and stores. Tomorrow at sunset, when my first day of fasting came to a close, and during the time leading up to sunset, I will be looking out for that symbol before sitting down to eat anything. I had already walked almost two miles, and I had not seen one halal shop so far. A narrow alley, completely different from the wide main street that I walked down, led me to my Shinjuku hostel. There were no noises in the alley. It was lit with dimmer light and colors and very peaceful. It was completely clean. No garbage anywhere. No piss on the corners or even globs of gum mashed into the ground. There were no tossed or empty bottles or cigarette butts. There was no dog sh or dogs. There were no mounds of mucus or spit on the curb. There was a cool breeze, like there often is in the warm spring when the sun had been down for hours. I stood still for some seconds, let the breeze move over me, and the silence soothed me. I took a deep breath, thinking this is how Tokyo feels after being here for less than one hour. It was an unfamiliar feeling from my seven years in America. The Japanese were conducting business or being served. There was not one menacing glare. There was not one man who exuded a threat. I had not seen one cop or even thought about my guns. Maybe when I wake up tomorrow, it would all change. But for now, I was feeling all right.
In my temporary room, the heavy and attractive door slid open from right to left. It was well built and perfectly on track. I inspected it carefully. I didn't know if it was because my southern Sudanese grandfather was a craftsman who worked with wood and made and built all types of things that I always paid attention to the quality and craftsmanship of everything. I just knew that it was something I did. As soon as I shut the door behind me, I noticed and then confirmed that it actually had no lock on it. <sighs> Yo! It was not that the door was damaged or broken. It simply was not designed with a lock on either side. A quick walk back down the hallway, I asked about the lock. The same security guard who had let me in and performed a deep bow to greet me when I first arrived explained in a series of mostly gestures that the front door to the hostel was locked and secure. The only way for anyone to enter was with the electronic key, the same key he had given me after I paid for a two-night nice stay. Or I could be buzzed in, but he assured me that he was in full control of the buzzer and that there was 24-hour security. Therefore, there was no reason for the individual guest room doors to be locked. The Sudan in me observed his humanity and understood his manner and believed in the honor system. The Brooklyn in me did not, could not, would not, refused. Back inside the room, I put my duffel bag on my bed. I unpacked only the items I would need for one night. Even though the two-night fee I had already paid was non-refundable, I decided I would be up and out of here in the morning with my mind set on finding a better spot to chill while I carried out my plans to link back up with Ak and me. I don't exactly know what kind of impact being transported from empire to empire has on the human body, but I do know that it does have an impact. To snatch my energy back and regain my focus, I pushed the bed all the way into the corner. I moved the desk all the way over and slid the chair underneath. With a wide enough space now, I did 200 push-ups, 250 sit-ups, and 150 deep knee bends. I sparred an imaginary rival, and I didn't let up until I defeated him. When I did... I collapsed onto the hard floor, dragged myself to the wall, and sat with my back pressed against it. My knees bent below me and my body balanced on my toes. I would remain this way until I thought everything through. With my injured shoulder tightening up some more and 18 minutes into thought, I concluded that when I saw the girl Iwa Akita heard the airport announcement that came over the loudspeaker in Japanese, she realized that I was somewhere in Japan. Maybe she even deciphered that I was calling from Narita Airport. For some reason, she was willing to help me and Akemi in the beginning, at least, to connect over the telephone. I figured that was easy for her as long as I was 7,000 miles away but not in person. She must have never expected me to come here. My arrival had shocked her, surprised her, or maybe even disappointed her. She was like the others. She had underestimated me. More troubling to me was that I never got to find out if my wife was actually there at Iowa Akita's house waiting to talk with me when I called like I had requested her to be in my previous voicemail that I left days ago. Did this girl Iwa only need to turn around and hand knock at me the phone, but instead had smiled at her and said, It's nobody. It was the wrong number. If Akami was there waiting, could the girl have pretended that I never kept my word and called? Or maybe she never gave my initial message in the first place. And who is this Iowa anyway? And how close a friendship did she have with Akemi? How good a friend could she be if she knew Akemi's true heart and still sabotaged her? 
the voice in the human mind that purposely tries to argue in the opposite direction of life and love suggested that maybe Akemi was at fault somewhere in all of this. Maybe she wanted my call, but not my visit. But I shut that voice down. The devil is a liar. Under a dim lamp, I pulled out those three addresses once more. One was in Ginza, which was close by, and a prefecture of Tokyo, and the other in Rapongi Hills, which was also part of Tokyo. And the last one was three hours away in Kyoto. I needed to solidify my strategy. Should I attempt to meet and talk with a father first, as Uma suggested, and anticipate that he would allow me to see Akemi afterward? Or should I seek Akemi out face to face first, and then confront her father? Kieza said that all schools were closed in Japan for Golden Week. This meant that the school address that I had in Kyoto wouldn't work at this moment. I needed to check with Kieza and find out exactly when the schools reopened. For now, the other two Tokyo addresses were my only option. I just had to be careful not to do anything that gave Akemi's father the upper hand. After all, he wanted to steal her away from me permanently. Didn't he? After dealing with my study cards, flipping, reciting, and memorizing, I wanted to go back outside to explore the Tokyo night. Easily, I could get over to Ginza and peep and feel out the place where the address was located. Was it Nakamura's house, their Tokyo apartment, or his office? But I couldn't leave my luggage in an unlocked room. I wouldn't gamble with my Tim's, Clark's, Polo, or my gear compounded by the value of my Uma's gifts and the items that belong to my wife. I took out the book that Sensei had given to me concerning Akemi's father. Sensei was right. I need real information on this guy to know what I was up against. Know thy enemy. Sun Tzu had written in his book, The Art of War, which Sensei required me to read when I was 12 years young. It took me some time and a lot of thought and vocabulary word checking in the Webster's Dictionary, but I read it. So I cracked open the old but well-kept pages of Never Surrender, the soft cover book, a biography written about my wife's father. Forward. Born on August 9th, 1945, the same day that America dropped the two-ton bomb on Nagasaki, Japan, three days after America dropped the world's first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan, Naoko Nakamura is said to have revenge embedded in his soul. He never got the chance to meet his father, an ominous mogul who was evaporated by the American bomb, the grand finale to an unprecedented bombing campaign that made most of Japan a heap of toxic ashes scattered around impromptu graveyards. Instantly, his father's body liquefied after it evaporated. Only his teeth remained to identify him and confirm his death. Hisashi Nakamura's teeth were discovered more than a year after the atomic blast. They were lodged in the cement of a Nagasi sidewalk, much like the prints of dinosaurs and other ancient creatures that have been excavated from rocks. He did leave a will, however, in which Naoko Nakamura, his only son, was bequeathed several hundred acres of prime property in various locations throughout Japan. Naoko Nakamura, according to the will, was to receive deeds to the properties on his 20th birthday, at which time he would become their legal owner. During his early years, Naoko Nakamura was an erudite student obsessed with military history, military training, political science, and strategies of amassing power. As the majority of Japanese were rebuilding and busy actively forging friendships with America, as well as social and cultural exchanges and partnerships, Naoko Nakamura was patiently plotting and planning his own financial and political wealth and quietly ensuring his influence. 
Known for being inflexible, calculating, and cold in both his business and personal dealings, Naoko Nakamura parted ways and severed ties even with his own mother. Enraged that Hana Nakamura, while he was still a child, had sold prime portions of his father's properties to the American government, which then used the properties to erect and expand American military bases in Japan. Naoko, at age 20, grabbed what remained of his inheritance and discontinued his communication with her, even becoming estranged from his two stepbrothers born of her second marriage. Within a year, Naoko Nakamura was rumored to have formed a secret and financial alliance with Yakuza boss Omote Tora, wherein Naoko laundered hundreds of millions of yen for the gangster. These illicit revenues formed the foundation of Naoko Nakamura's wealth. It also won Naoko pivotal friendships and solid connections because of his ability to access, appropriate, lend, and borrow huge sums of capital. Naoko Nakamura and Omote Tora both deny that any secret alliance existed between them, yet Naoko benefited from the rumor of being allied with quote-unquote major muscle they had never been seen or photographed together in any public or private setting. By 1970, when he was 25, Naoko Nakamura's company, the Pan-Asian Corporation, was poised to take over several key lucrative Asian markets where Americans had dominated in the past. Using a brand of Asian solidarity, quote-unquote, that his critics considered a false cover and a method of increasing his own wealth, Naoko grabbed the ghost of the past to forge forward and dominate. When I finished reading the foreword, I had circled six words. Excavated. Bequeathed. Erudite. Estranged. Laundered. And illicit. Immediately, I looked them up and wrote them down in my pocket notebook after committing their meaning to my memory. As I sat thinking, there was one major point in the book that stood out in my mind. He never got the chance to meet his father. I thought to myself that this one fact could easily make any boy a half a man. As I tried to imagine never having met my own father, I couldn't. I couldn't erase the deep love or powerful lessons that came to me directly from my father in person. I tried to subtract the parts of me that came from my father, but nothing was left over. As I tried to push myself to imagine it, my thoughts simply exploded and I didn't want to know. Maybe if I had not ever met my father, I'd just be crazy like those Brooklyn boys in my American hood. Inflexible, calculating, and cold, the author had described Nakamura. I didn't need to write that down. I will remember that description for as long as he will remember that atomic bomb. Heavy-minded, I laid down with my back purposely pressed against my luggage. If there were an intruder here at Shinjuku Uchi bent on robbery, he would have to be clever enough to get past me as I slept and behind me to remove my 50-pound duffel bag without me waking. Impossible, I assured myself. When I lay down, something in my duffel bag was poking me. I got up and grabbed the bag and unhooked the top. When I looked in and felt around, I could tell it was Akemi's five-inch heels that were digging into my back. I snatched them out and also removed her hardback diary. I placed the shoes on my desktop, stood them side by side. I lay her diary down at first. Then I picked it back up, flipping through the first few pages. Even under the dimp lamplight, embedded between, beside, and below her kanji handwriting, her drawings lit up, stood out, and somehow seemed to breathe life. On one page in the back of her book, I saw the kanji for my name, Mayonaka. I knew it because she had drawn it for me on a napkin at a Jamaican restaurant on our first date up in Harlem. I smiled to myself. It was a curious thing how a man born in the shadow of a bomb with a heart hardened by history and circumstance 
could bring forth such a sweet young daughter, Akemi. I hooked the duffel bag up and threw it back up against the wall. I lay back down and eased myself into a sleep. Welp, unfortunately, folks, I got to take a pause for the cause just because I have to inform y'all to tune in to the next episode of Ralph Reads. I would like, or rather love, to thank you, fellow queens and kings, for tuning in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. If you would like to leave a small donation or connect with me via social media, please do so via www.solo.to forward slash RGMC 2407. And don't forget to tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book. Read a good story and set your good self free. I appreciate you and I love you like cooked food. I will see you fellow sexy people on the next edition of Ralph Reads. Love is the word. It's what we all need. Imagine a world where love replaced greed. Some of us have the idea to plant the seed. I guarantee it's the best since weed. Wanna sound like a professional? The Merge Studio should be your next stop. A private, intimate environment by invite only. Our engineer has years of experience mastering mix downs, production, and beats. Available all in our one stop shop of entertainment. Merge Studios, let us help you sound the best, be the best, and beat the rest. Together at Merge Studios. Mike Mountain, I want to give a special shout out to Ralph Anthony Garcia of the United Ronin Networks at YouTube. Make sure y'all go to the United Ronin Networks at YouTube. Check out his channel. Check out his series, Ralph Reads. Give it a like. Subscribe to his channel and um, check out what he got to offer. Some really good stuff up there. This is Mike Mountain, and this message is approved by me. Peace. You are now experiencing the Ren Pet phenomenon, an Afro futuristic book series. Afro futurism is the cure to sci fi. Download now and experience melanin biotechnology.